Okay, hello everybody, depending on your time zone. Good evening, good night, good morning. Uh, today's subject is quite hot. Up until now, there wasn't any tool to use if you are developing a single Power BI data model with multiple developers. This, this was one of the weak points of Power BI ecosystem and things are getting better. For those who don't know me, my name is Sully, living in London. From I'm originally from Turkey. I'm a data platform MVP like Steve. Without further ado, we are all ears. Steve, thanks a lot for joining us. It's it's a, it's great pleasure to have you again. Hello, thank you very much. I will share my screen and let's get started. Just make sure you can all see okay. Yes, Crystal. Awesome. So yeah, uh, nice to meet you. Thanks for the introduction. Just a quick bit about me. So my name's Steve Campbell. I do Power BI training and consulting. And um, I am the owner of a, a recently formed company, Sunny BI. Um, and that's what we do, kind of training and reporting. And we often do big deployments, um, rolling out kind of Power BI, lots of governance. Git and Power BI developer mode, all this sort of stuff, falls very much into that and this enterprise way of doing stuff. Um, Sunny BI training, I'll maybe I'll come post uh, the link. A lot of this stuff, um, and don't worry, <laughs> this website's on every single slide, so you won't forget it. A lot of the concepts are also on there if you want to go back and revisit um, and, and have some stuff. So definitely check that out afterwards because you can double check some of the concepts we're going through today. So Git and Power BI developer mode. Firstly, Please feel free if you have any questions to, to interrupt to, on the chat, post a question. Um, it will be read out and, and we'll make sure that uh, you understand everything. To kind of go over this, this uh, session, it's going to be very much an intro. We're going to really try and look at understanding Git. So if you haven't had any experience with it before, don't worry. We'll go over all the concepts from a nice non-technical point of view. Um, we'll look at Power BI developer mode. Now, Power BI developer mode is very new. It's a new mode that enable us to do Git. So it's very exciting. There is probably a bit of a way to go. So now is the time that we should really start learning and have a look at what it is. So with that, let's kick off. So Git, what is Git? I'm sure you've all seen an Excel sheet like this. Now, Git, put simply, is a type of version control. And often, especially if we're in a finance team and doing financey Excel stuff, we can version control stuff like this, right? Just adding versions and saving different files. So this is a way to version control. Obviously, this gets a bit out of hand um, unless we saw this in order, I wouldn't know which is the, the final one. And I'm sure you've all had experiences with files like this. And you can all probably say some of the negative things that come around. What makes this even more complex is I'm probably not the only one who's ever updating or using these files. We have a bunch of people here. And if we all try to use this. There's lots of emailing all over the place. We don't know what's going on. So obviously we need some better source of version control. So one method is what if we just had one central version, right, that we all connect to, and it's always the latest version, and we're happy and, and have this centralized version control. Now we could think of tools such as um, SharePoint sort of follows this. If you've ever used TFS and before this, this is what that was. If you haven't, don't worry. However, Git takes a slightly different approach. And we'll go into how this all works, so don't worry just yet. But Git says, we're going to use something called a distributed version control. So Git says, everybody gets a copy of what we're working on. And then we'll have one location, which is central. And that we all have individual copies, we work on them, and then we can save them back. And Git is really this whole process around managing us all having individual copies, merging them into this one main copy. 
this may seem a bit more complicated, but we'll see why having this distributed method where we're all working on, on copies works a lot better. You can see right off the bat that maybe if we're working on a copy, it's going to be a lot safer. And if we mess up and do something we're not meant to, we're not affecting the, the main version. So that is Git at a high level. It is a distributed version control. So let's have a look now at how it works. So we're going to go over some Git basics. And a lot of this is we're going to start talking about specific terms. We're going to go through all the terms of Git, and then at the end, we'll have a quick demo of how it all works. So some of the main terms you'll hear is these commit, merge, and repos. So we're going to start with the basics with Git and go through and see what these terms mean. So let's look at our example. Now we'll see we've kind of expanded the top left version here. One thing that is important to remember, Git is really designed to be used with code. When I say code, it's things like um, in Power BI, especially JSON files, right, or it could be SQL, anything which is essentially a text file in a certain format that has lines of code. So in our example, we're going to have a look here. I assume it's just working. And we're going to have an example of this top left developer. Now, he was working on his local machine here. So when you see this, what we mean by local machine is, is my desktop, right? I'm not working on some cloud version stored in a central place. I have a little code file that I'm going to type and work on my local machine. We'll see, obviously, this doesn't quite relate to Power BI, how we know it. Developer mode is what opens this code up and lets us use Power BI with Git. So let's have a look specifically at, at this top developer. So as I said, he's working on his local machine. Now he has a code file. So in this very simple, um, this is actually what, what kind of the underlying code of Power BI looks like. Right, we've got two columns here and some descriptions. Obviously, code files are generally much bigger than this, but to keep it simple, we're just going to have you know these eight lines of code. And when I say again code files, it's pretty much means just a text file with any sort of code in, in some sort of coding language written out in a specific format. But underneath, they're all really just text files. So what is Git? So I'm working on this, and really what Git is, is Git is a little database which we're going to install on our local machine. And what we put in this database is essentially different saved versions of our code. So this current state, I might say, I'm going to, I'm going to use Git. So I use a tool, and we'll look at a couple of the tools that do Git. But I have a special tool, and I open it up, and I say, yes, I want to put use Git. And it's just going to save a version of this code. Then let's say I make some changes to my code. Here I've added some more lines. What I then do is I save this again. And instead of saving it with a different file name or in a different location, I just save it into my, my Git database. So I'm never having multiple files. I'm not doing this whole budget version one, two. Git manages for me. So it's a little database I can just save all my versions into. And maybe I delete this column and save it again. Now, what Git does is it gives you this ability to pick any version you've saved. It doesn't overwrite it. It keeps all the versions in history. And of course, when we're talking about code, these are really just text files. So they're very small in size. So this is quite easy to do. It doesn't take a whole bunch of space to do this. So if I wanted to go back and I thought, oops, um, I didn't mean to do that. Let's roll back. Let's go back to version two. I can simply just go back to version two, go forward to version three again. And because it saved every version, um, as it is when I when I said I wanted to save it, it keeps them all. And I can roll back. So we regularly save the version of our code into our little Git database. And in Git language, because we like to use confusing terms, this is what we call a commit. So we're saying we're committing our code. Basically, it just means we're saving it. So 
one thing we said is Git is a what we call a distributed version control system. So what happens is we have multiple people working on their own little copies of the code. We're all saving this locally. We're committing it into our little, little database. We're all doing this independently. Now, obviously, we'll need some main copy of the code where once we've done our changes, we have to put our changes back. So we have this main copy of our code. And what we call this is a repository, or really most people call it a, a repo. So when you hear the term repo, it just means this, this main copy of the code. And that main copy of the code is going to be stored in the cloud online somewhere because everyone has to access it. Our versions that we're working on and we're saving committing, they're on a local machine. And one thing about Git, which probably isn't a big deal anymore, but you can do it offline, right? You don't need to be connected to the internet. You don't need access to everyone else. I take a copy and do it offline and we have our main copy of the code. Obviously, once I've made my changes, I want to add my changes back to the main copy of the code. And this is called a merge. And the reason we call it a merge is I'm not replacing the main copy of the code with my version. What I'm doing is I'm just going to update the little bits of code that I've changed in the main copy. And this is a really important concept. This is what makes it work that everyone can have copies. They can all be working independent of each other. But when we go back and say, I've finished with my copy, I want to you know, uh, merge it back to the main repo, to the main copy. I'm just going to change the bits that I've changed. We'll see an example of this. So these are our first three terms. Commit is really just when we're saving it locally, having all these different saved versions. We have a repo, which is the main copy. And then once we are happy with our version, we've made the changes, we're going to merge. And that is just update the bits of code that we changed in the main version. So let's talk about branching. And we'll start seeing some examples of, of how this all works. Now, Git, you'll notice, is really copies of copies. We're always working on a copy of a code, and it's normally a copy of the copy of the code. This has a lot of advantages in the fact that it really helps us do reviews. And one of the main things is it helps us catch errors very early on. It is used when you have multiple developers working on the same, the same file. And that means that lots of people are doing different things, and we have to keep track of all the changes everyone's making. And we want to keep catch errors very early. So now we're talking about our, our copy of the code. We have this main copy of the code. So this is in our repo. We have a main copy. Imagine this is our Power BI report. We might say, OK, I want to add a new table. I want to add a new dimension table to my Power BI model. So we're going to call this a feature because we're adding something. It's a, it's a feature. We're adding something new. So instead of us all working off the, the copy that's live and that end users are using, what we'll do is we'll say we'll make a branch. You can think each of these little nodes as different copies of the code. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something called a branch. Theoretically, you could think of a branch as a new folder on your desktop, for example. right? It's a different location, just a copy of the code. So we've said, I'm going to take the main copy that everyone's looking at. and We know we want to make some edits. So instead of doing this to that, that version that people are using, we'll first copy it over. So we'll make a, what we call a branch, which is just simply another work stream, like another folder. We'll say, we'll take a copy. That way, if we really mess something up when we're working in it, or instead of adding the table, we accidentally delete some stuff, it doesn't matter because this is just a copy. So we're over here. We have this task to work on this, this copy. Then what happens is a little time after we've started this, somebody notices that in our existing report, there's actually an error, right? One of the measures is incorrect and it's been written wrong. No one's noticed it. It's live. Our end users are, are using it. We realize that one of the measures are wrong. 
So we say we need to fix this ASAP. Right? This is top priority. So what we do is we go back to the main code that everyone's using and we create another branch with this hotfix branch. And again, this is another separate um, work stream that may be the same team or it might be a different team. It might be several people who work on this, this branch. And they're just going to fix this measure. So they work ahead and this is top priority. And they've realized what they've made the mistake. They update their measure. They're happy with it. And they say, OK, we fix this measure. So they say, this branch that we fixed the measure, we've tested it. Now let's merge that back into the main branch. So on that hot fix branch where we fix the measure, we say, we're going to add our changes to the fixed measure back to the main copy of the code. So now, right here, this copy of the code, and if you can think of each, each node as a copy, includes the changes that we made here. So this is where we fix an error. We say the line of code that, that we fixed, we're going to update as well, and we're just going to merge it back. Now you'll notice that as our feature team is working on the copy that they're working sorry the copy they're working on which is this copy you know they're making some edits they're changing stuff they're adding a table so it's quite a big piece of work this copy here this came from a copy up here and now we know our code down here is different so these are these are different versions right and this is actually what makes git very powerful because if we had done this hotfix would we have merged it back in everywhere? We wouldn't have known how to have these two parallel branches running at the same time. With Git, it doesn't matter. They can keep working on the feature branch because they're adding a new table. Having that correct measure and that fixed measure, it doesn't affect them. They can still do what they're doing. And then what they do is they're happy with their table. They say, I want to add our changes, this new table, back into the main copy of the code. Because we're not replacing the whole file, because we're just updating the little bits of text that we did, it's not going to affect what the hotfix branch do. Now, of course, if you both worked on the same measure or the same lines of code, or we both tried to edit the table in different ways, we would have something called a conflict. We would have to say, look, both teams have worked on the same thing. However, in this use case, and in most use cases, because Git is all about management as well, so you should know what everyone's working on. And it's a bit about project management, making sure people aren't working on the same thing. But the hotfix branch fixed a measure. The feature branch added a new table. These were different parts of the code. They didn't interact with each other. They weren't um, reliant on each other. So we can merge these both back. And even though we took them from different parts and merged them back, because we're just merging, it all works fine. So let's have a look at this in a bit more detail. We're going to keep this really simple. And our code is just three lines of code. And typically when you have code, right, you have the line numbers. And that's, that's how this works. So our code just says, hello world, bye. And that's the code we're going to edit. Now, we've said we want to make some changes. We want to change the code a bit. So again, instead of working off the main copy and, and risk messing up the version that people are looking at, we're going to make a branch. So we copy over this branch. And this is what we call checking out. Right? We check out the code. We create a new branch. So let's have a look at this branch in detail. Now, we said everyone works off a local copy of the code. So I will make a copy of that branch onto my local machine. So really my copy is a copy of the branch, which is a copy of the main version. And this separation of, of everything allows us to have lots of different checks and allows us to not mess up. And it actually helps a lot. So what we say is we say that we have the remote version. And when we say it's the remote, it's because it's, it's in a central location as the cloud. So we have this, this branch, which is part of that, that repo right in the cloud. It's a copy of the main version, but it's still that centralized area. Then me, myself, working on it, I will take a copy of this onto my local machine. 
And this is where I do those commits and saves and changes. We call that local and remote. I'm going to skip through this because it's not too important. But in my local copy, you'll often see things called working directory staging and local repository. I'm not going to spend any time on this. Um, basically, it just means you have different steps. But if you hear these stage, if you hear these terms, just remember this is the internal workings of that, that local database of Git. So not important, but I just want to highlight the terms. So let's have a let's have a look. I'm going to work on my copy. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the second line of code. So instead of hello world by, I look at the requirements I've been given and I want to change it to hello planet by. So I'm doing this and saving it. I'm committing each of this as a commit to save. Right now, this is just on my local version. I haven't merged it or put it back to the to the remote to the central version. However, it's all about being a team working with other people. So typically, um, it's not just me. And if it was just me, I probably wouldn't need Git, right? The Git is to manage your team to have multiple developers. So what we had is Dave is also in my team who's working on this feature. So Dave also took a copy. And Dave's changed line number one. So Dave said, hey, world by. Now, because we both took a copy at the beginning and we now both worked independently, Dave's copy says, hey, world by. My copy says, hello, planet by, right? Because we're working independently. Now, of course, we need to frequently communicate because we don't want to keep working without talking to each other and possibly you know, overwrite things that the other person has done. So what Dave does is he says, I'm happy with the changes. Um, my task was just to change line one. So Dave just changed line one. And so what he's going to do is he wants to, to merge his changes back to the, to the main branch. This is called a push. So Dave says, I'm going to add my changes back to the main one so that other people can see what I've done. Because before that, remember, it was all done locally on your local machine. So Dave pushes his and syncs his changes back to that the remote to that main version. Then what I do is I say, I wonder if anyone's done anything. So I can say, I want to do a pull action. And what that means is it says on my local machine, go look at the that version in the cloud on the branch, pull any changes into my version. And you see, because Dave changed line one and I've changed line two, I can then pull the changes and I'll have Dave's changes and my changes in the version that I'm looking at. Obviously, if we had both worked on line one, it would be what's called a conflict because we'd say you both tried to change the same thing. And that's why communication is really important. And a lot of the tools that manage Git basically help manage this. And we work in teams and we all should know what we're doing. The technology itself, it can do this and says, hey, you haven't got any um, conflicts. Dave's changed line one, you've changed line two. So we merge the changes. And this is what it means to merge, right? Merge them together. So then I see the final code. I say, hey, planet by. And this is actually what our feature was. This is what we were asked to do. So I'm going to push my changes back up as well. So now our final code is hey, planet by. And that's incorporated both my changes and also Dave's changes. So this push and pull is a way for us to communicate because we're working all individually. The fact that we work individually doesn't have any reliance on each other. It helps us keep going and it gives us extra uh, separation. But we keep communicating and we, we push and pull our changes from the main branch. Now, obviously, normally codes are hundreds of lines long, so we shouldn't really be working on the same thing. And we would both have tasks and be told exactly, and we should know exactly what we're changing. So you shouldn't be changing the same thing. If you are, that's a project management issue. So now we've finished with our branch. We can say, we've said, hey, we've, we've done our changes. We're happy with it. Again, the reason we're doing this in a branch and not on that main copy 
is that if we had really messed up or we said, nope, let's start again, we could just delete this, right? And just start again, because we're not editing that, that main copy. However, we're happy. We say, we've done the changes. Let's merge this back into the main branch. However, an extra advantage of this is whenever we do this and we say, we want to put our branch back to the main version, but it's only me and Dave who have done all the changes. So a really good practice is what we call a pull request. And this is a term you may have heard. We can say we're raising a pull request. What this really means is that we're going to have a bunch of people review our changes. And it's really just a, a check. A pull request is really just a check on when you're merging a branch into another branch. In this case, this branch into main. So these other people will go ahead and they will say yes or no. They'll do double checks on your code. So this is an extra way to spot errors. As well as having both me and Dave working and checking, pushing, putting, we also have this pull request, which is this extra layer of security. So it really helps us stopping errors very early on. And it will submit the changes to be reviewed. And the, the team can either say yes or no. And they can say, no, you and Dave actually you got something wrong you can send it back big thing about git as well is everything you do you add comments so every time you make commits every time you you submit stuff you'll add comments on what you changed and this has a really good history to making sure everyone can see what's happened who's changed it it also says who did it so we can have a, a very open and easy way to see what's changed and why Okay, that's kind of Git in a nutshell. We're going to talk a little about CI/CD. So, the first thing, or one other thing we can do, is CI/CD is all about automating stuff. So, we really want everything to be automated. So, when we go through this, uh, this merging from our branch back into the main version, we have this pull request, as we just said. This is a manual process where people review. We can also do an automatic process. And that says every time somebody tries to merge this back in, we kick off something called a build pipeline. It's a bit of a weird terminology, but a build pipeline really means we just run some automated process. In Power BI, a really good example is we can use Tabular Editor's Best Practice Analyzer. Now, if you're not familiar with Tabular Editor or the Best Practice Analyzer, it's a really, really cool tool that's open source. And it basically runs some automated checks against your model. This could be things like, is the, is the code correct? Is the schema correct? We could also do things if we have the code files, for example, on the visual reports, we could say, if you have more than 20 visuals on a page, we won't let you do this and will automatically fail because we have a rule where you have to have less than 20 visuals. So you can set up rules to make sure that what the developers are doing following best practice. So this can run automatically and that means it's an extra way of catching errors. So if a developer went and tried to make a page with 22 visuals, they would automatically get an error saying you can't do this. That's way too many visuals that goes against best practice. So it's an automated test. And then again, it's important to say these tests are testing the code itself. So we could have measures which we pass and they're, they're fine and they're well written measures. The code is correct. Doesn't mean the business logic's right or the numbers itself is correct because that requires knowing the values and refreshing the data set. So this is just looking at the code. So anything which is just including the code itself, for example, the DAX code or the Power Query code, that's where we can run automated tests. And here's an example, right? And I just said this, if we have, for example, over 20 visuals, right? We could set an automated test to, to fail. CICD really stands for Continuous integration and continuous deployment. Continuous integration, so it's really 
two things, CICD. Practice of automating the integration of code from multiple contributors. What does that mean? That's really all that Git part. So it's automating, for example, these build pipelines, running this automated stuff, making everything we talked about automated. We like to automate stuff because the less things we have to do manually, the less chance we can mess up. And also it's going to be a lot quicker to get things out. Continuous deployment is the automating of testing and releasing. So in Power BI land, this could mean testing the actual DAX measures. Are the measures actually correct? You know, is the sum of sales actually showing the correct number? And then after we've automated those tests, deploying this and publishing it to the end users. So how do we do that? That's something called environments. So as we said, after we've done a review and we've done the pull request and the code's good, we want to make sure the changes are correct. So we need to test, for example, the measures or anything to the data model. And we might need to have a user test the, the visuals and the reports, do things like do the bookmarks work correctly, right? Because they might be, the code might be correct, but they might just go to the wrong page or instead of writing the sum of sales, we've written the average sales. So we need to know is our, our logic correct. And obviously we want to do this before the end user sees a report. We don't release this to everyone and then people come back and say this is wrong because that will make your reporting projects fail very quick. So what we do is we create a separate workspace. So in Power BI, we can think of environments as workspaces. So they line up really nicely. Typically, we'll have at least kind of three workspaces. And these are the three environments. You can have more. And with the release actually this month of um, some stuff in deployment pipelines, you can actually have up to 10, I believe now. But typically, you'll see three workspaces. The first workspace we'll call development. This is the first environment. This development, this is where we do all of Git. So everything we talked about in Git, all the, the integration, the copying of code, the pipelines, they all happen on the development workspace. So this is where we make changes and we're happy with it. And we say, yep, we commit the changes and we trigger our build pipelines, our pull requests. And then we say, we're happy that the code is correct. Let's, let's kick it off. So then we run something called a deployment pipeline. This will essentially copy all the, the, the code, so maybe the reports, the data sets from the development workspace into the test workspace. The test workspace is, if you hadn't guessed it, where testing happens. So we'll try and automate this as much as possible. There are some advanced tools where you can run tests and DAX, that kind of stuff. Sometimes we'll just do this manually and actually just go to the reports and look and check if they're correct. Then if they are correct and we're happy, we run a deployment pipeline and it goes to the production or the prod environment. This is, for example, where your app would be. And this then, once it's in this environment, this is what the end users are accessing. And this is what they're going to view and how they're going to see the reports. It's really splitting out and making sure that we have extra testing and lots of ways to catch errors before they go out. So deployment pipeline, as we mentioned quickly, this is really just a process which moves code from one environment to the other. Power BI, this could just copying the data set from one workspace to the other. And I said, designed to be automated and we can run automated tests where possible. You can have them in Power BI Premium. There's a deployment pipeline. So if you've seen that, that's what they are. Um, they also are available in other things. So for example, Azure DevOps has what they call release pipelines, which is the same thing. So lots of tools which can do this for you and areas where you can set this up. Another thing that we want to talk about is diff compares. Now, the advantage of having everything in code is that we can use something called diff compares. We'll see a little example of this, but a diff compare just shows us one version of the code to another version of a code. In this example, 
Um, this is from a dev, dev environment into a test environment. So we can see what's changed in the code. Anything in green means that we've added something, and things in red means we've deleted something. So it's an easy way to quickly look at the code and see the changes that have been made. And this is that merging bit. So the bits which aren't highlighted, you know, they won't get changed because we haven't changed those lines of code. This also happens in the Git process. So when I'm comparing my copy to the copy in the remote in the repo, it can be any time you're comparing just two versions of code. Then GitHub and Azure. Azure DevOps. So just to clarify some things. Git. Git is the system and the process for tracking changes in collaboration and code. So Git itself is talking about the process of that system. It's an open source project, and this is why so many people use it. Right? It's open source, it's not really owned by anyone. It's just that whole process. GitHub is a cloud platform that hosts Git repositories. So obviously we talked about merging and doing branching. We need some sort of software enabled to do this. And GitHub is a software. So it's a, well, it's a service, it's not software necessarily, it's a cloud service owned by Microsoft. So it's a tool you go and you can pay for it as well. I think there's, there is a free version, but pay for it. And then you can do all Git stuff on GitHub. And Git is the process itself. Azure DevOps is another one, similar to GitHub. Um, it's another service for end-to-end -end software development, right? And it manages Git. It also does a lot of cool stuff. I really like DevOps. You do a lot of things like project management, planning, and deploying has all the environments, all of this stuff as well. It's a really end-to-end -end service. This is also owned by Microsoft as well. Um, there is a ton more owned by other people. Microsoft don't own all of them. Um, obviously, this is a Power BI one, and these are the two we'll typically use and probably the most popular, especially if you're talking about Microsoft products. So that takes us on to Power BI developer mode. So what is Power BI developer mode? I've been talking about code files and having silly examples where it says, hello world. None of this really relates to Power BI because we know Power BI, we have PBIX files up until a couple of months ago. Power BI developer mode is the name of a way you can save Power BI files. It is still in preview, but imagine we have this. So we're on a local machine again. We have Power BI desktop. We're working on a PBIX file. So PBIX is that the file extension of Power BI, if you're not familiar. I want to save this. Um, I'll come back to that question at the end. So I, I want to save this. Instead of saving as a Power BI file, a PBIX file, Power BI developer mode, and I'll show you an example, saves it into a folder. And actually what it does, instead of just being one PBIX file, it splits out all the elements, so the data sets and the visuals and the reports, into lots of different code files. So Power BI developer mode is the name of how it splits out a Power BI file into lots of code files. And we call this, they call this a Power BI project. So you hear Power BI project, Power BI developer mode, it, it, it normally talking about the same thing. Now that we have all this in code files, we can use a, a code editor. I used Visual Studio Code. It's free and it's Microsoft, and I think it's really good. You could use, for example, Notepad and actually look at the code itself. But the good thing with Visual Studio Code is it does Git. So it has Git add-ins. Um, within it automatically. So what this means is that using Visual Studio Code, I can sync this to a repo, right? So that main copy of the code. Right now, uh, we do everything in Azure DevOps, uh, spelling error, let's just say Azure DevOps, um, and we'll see why. So we have the copy on my local machine where I check out and I work. Then using a tool like Visual Studio Code, this is how I merge it into my online repo. 
which in this case is Azure DevOps. The really cool thing about this is that Visual Studio Code has this diff format so I can see what I've changed compared to my repo. But the actual cool thing is once I merge it, Azure DevOps can actually sync into a Fabric workspace. So everything I publish to the Azure DevOps will automatically be synced to Fabric. It has to be a Fabric workspace. So I don't need to worry about you know, going through the whole Git process and then having to publish it, all of this. I just check in, check out the code through Git, and then Fabric will manage everything. So <laughs> now we're going to get into a really quick demo. I'm going to go through everything. This isn't a walkthrough or documentation on how to do it. There is documentation out there. Um, I just want to show you end to end what this looks like. So I know I'm going to be moving quite quick, but I want to just show you the terms in action. So the first part is this. Before we even do any of this Git stuff, we have to make Power BI into files because Git, we need code files. So what I'm going to do is I have a blank folder on my desktop. To show you, it's called Git Demo. So this is a blank folder that I have on my desktop. Now, I'm going to open a Power BI file. So this is just a Power BI file. This is a, a demo file from Microsoft. And you can go download it um, from their from Microsoft website. In the options and settings, the first thing you have to do is this is a preview feature. So in preview features, you have to make sure that this setting is saved, uh, turned on. Because as I said, and this is developer mode. As I say, sometimes they call it Power BI project. It's it's the same thing. This is still in preview, so to make sure you realize that. Now that this is um, turned on, I will go to save as, and I'm going to go to my new folder. Now instead of saving it as a Power BI file, I'm going to save it as a PBIP file. So this is a new dropdown available. So I can save this as Power BI project file. I'm going to save this. Now it's saved. If I go back to my folder, I will notice that instead of just one file like I normally have, I have a whole bunch of folders. And within these folders, I have different files. This is all the code files that, are, that make up a Power BI file. So it's the code behind the scenes. Now the advantage of having this it means I can do Git because I have to have code. So now all of this can work with my version control and my Git. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to head over to Visual Studio Code. I'm going to go really quickly through this um, because it's not a demo on how to do it. I just want to show the process. So what I'm going to do in Visual Studio Code, I can actually open a folder. And if I just go to my Git demo folder, I'm going to open this folder. And now I have access to everything in that folder. So it's a really cool um, tool. I can see that in the report folder, there's this report.json. So now what you're looking at is actually all the code which says how the report is laid out. Now, this doesn't make much sense to me. It's really difficult to understand, and it's just a bunch of nonsense code. For Git to work well, this should be easy to read. And they're working on this right behind the scenes. Obviously, they're going to try and make this better. This is still in preview mode. So right now, it's a little difficult to understand what's going on. What I then can do in um, Visual Studio is it has this source control tab. And I can click Initiate Repository. What Initiate Repository does is remember this step where we said we're working on right now, we've got some uh, code and we've done it into our local machine. Initiate repository adds this little database, right? And then this is what the Git is. So I'm going to click Initiate repository, and this starts Git. So now I've, I've added a little database. And in fact, if I go back to my folder, you'll see a hidden folder called .git. And this is actually where it saves everything. So this is that little Git database. So I've started Git. It's now asking me to commit because I haven't saved anything. So I want to save this. So 
you have to give it messages, right? And this is about adding comments. I'm going to call this the initial commit because this is the first time I'm saving anything to that database. These are all the files that make up my Power BI file. You'll notice some here, these are like the images as well. So lots of different code bits. So I'm going to commit this. So now what I've done is I've done this step of saving things into a Power BI project so I get code. That means I can use Git. I use Visual Studio Code. Within Visual Studio Code, I said initiate repository. It made me save, uh, made this database, and I basically did save version one. So now let's connect this to Azure because obviously this is still all local machine. So I go to Azure DevOps. You've never seen Azure DevOps before. Don't worry too much. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to my repos, right? So the repos where it, the cloud version where it's stored. Nothing in it right now because I just made this um, project moments before this class. So I'm going to link this repo up to my local ma machine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go here and I'm going to say uh, remote, right? And add remote. So this is saying add a remote version, connect to your version in the in online. A couple of ways you can do this, but I'm just going to do this for ease. I'm just going to paste in this link. Um, this is just a, a link I just copied off Azure DevOps so it knows where to look. And then it just says give it a name, it's called Azure. And now what I'm doing is I'm syncing this to my Azure DevOps, my, my repo. Um, this is my, my repo in the cloud. Then I can publish my branch. I would just say everything I've got in my local, I'm going to merge and I'm going to put into the cloud. Not really going to merge because there's nothing in it yet. Now, if I go back to Azure DevOps, I can refresh and I see all those files and I see everything that I had in my local version. So I've now done this, this sync between the two. So um, in Azure DevOps and in or in Visual Studio, you can actually do something called create branches. And I can do this either from the DevOps side or from, um, from my local machine. And I can create a new branch, and this could be feature new. Watch this. So now what I've done. Right, is I can, this is just how easy it is to create a new branch. And you'll see down here, it will tell you which branch you're in. So I have two currently. And the, the two are the main, and this is going to be that main copy of the code, or this feature new. This feature new is the one that I'm going to work on um, to add stuff because I don't want to work directly on the main one in case I mess up. So I'm working on a copy. What I can see now is if I go over to my Power BI file, let's say I make a couple of changes. I'm just going to move a couple of things. I'm going to save this, and then I'm going to close it down. You'll notice here, I'm just going to close this, that in the source control, automatically it's picked up that I've made a change because I saved and closed the file. So this will be kind of live as you're working on stuff. I made a change because I moved some stuff around, so we changed the underlying code. So I can still use Power BI Desktop. I don't need to write the code, but the change will reflect in the code. If I click on this, it does this nice diff compare, and it shows me everything I've changed. Again, this is really hard to understand what's going on, but you can kind of kind of guess right. You can see here the X and the Y. So this is probably that visual I moved. You can see I, I've moved the visual and it, this is just where it is on the page. Again, hopefully that'll work and make this easier to understand. But I can say, OK, I want to commit this. So I said I've moved my change. I commit, which is just saving locally. And then I can say sync my changes, which is that push. A sync really does a push and a pull together. But in this case, there's no one else. So I'm just pushing my changes. So write, write comments, you write better comments. But see, this action will push and pull commits, right? Commits being the local saves, and this is Azure feature new. That means it's telling me which branch I'm doing this to, which is good because I don't want to do it directly on the main. 
So now this is pushing, syncing up. If I go over here to my Azure DevOps again, I can see my branches and you see, oh, it's really cool, right? It says I've updated feature new just now. So I literally just did that. And this is the feature new branch that I made. So we're all in sync. I can click on this branch. Here you can see I can set up a build, which means I can do that automated process. I'm going to create a pull request. So this is saying I'm, I finish with my branch. I'm going to put a pull request so I merge it back into the main version. Normally you would have other people review it, but for now I'm just going to create it and I can just complete it. So don't worry about these. These are all just settings you can do. There's loads of settings. Normally I would have other people come and review it. So now I've updated the branch and it goes back to the main version. And that's closed that branch. So the final aspect here, I did this. I made those changes on my branch. I created the branch. I made those changes and I did a pull request because it's just me. Um, no one else reviewed it, but normally they would. So the final aspect is, well, OK, all I've got now is a bunch of code files in Azure DevOps, which isn't very helpful. So obviously, this, this is helpful if I can link it to Fabric. And to do that, I simply go to Power BI or to Microsoft Fabric. I'm going to go to my workspaces, and I'm going to go to my Git demo. Uh, let me actually, <laughs> I've done this before testing, so let me just build a new workspace, Git demo two. And this workspace has to be in a Fabric workspace. So I've got this new empty workspace. In the workspace settings, you now have Git integration. And this is really cool. And right now, you can only do your Azure DevOps account. Um, hopefully, they add more stuff. But I basically pick, and this is just a um, good example. This is just picking right the, the repository, the project, which I set up before. And then it's asked which branch. Now, I normally always want to stick this to the main branch because that's my main copy. So I can connect and sync. It will take a couple of minutes, but um, now what's happening is it's syncing all these files in Azure into Fabric. I maybe refresh, you might start seeing some stuff. And because it's Power BI, it doesn't sync all the individual files. It basically just syncs the data set and then the report as well. So those are the two things I'm going to see. So now I've synced up and I can see my re report. If I go into it, right, this is going to be the latest version that I committed. And you can see, um, I think there's some errors with the data here, but you can see I've moved stuff around. And that kind of goes full circle. So that is how you link all this up together. With that, um, we're very much on time. So I'm going to pause now, open any questions. Yeah, we have a question from Adrian. Uh, let me yes. read it for you. How do you change the references to databases and other resources between environments, like from development to test or production? Yeah. Um, so this is now a bit bit off Git, but in uh, similar stuff in deployment pipeline. So I've opened the deployment pipeline. If you're not familiar with them, I've synced this um, dev test and prod. Right. So there's three. What you can do is I can press this button here. This button is something called deployment rules. So when I press this, I say, let me choose the data set. And I can actually set up rules. So when I publish from my development into my test workspace, I can say I want to change the data source. And you'll be able to pitch, pick which data source. And then you can simply give it a new value. Obviously, depending on the data source, you might have you know, different uh, options, but here is how you do it. You can also add parameters. So if you had parameters in report, the deployment pipeline will do this. This means that if you have, for example, sensitive data that end users and um, that developers can't see, you can make the deployment pipeline change the uh, change the data source. Hopefully that, that answers your question. Uh, if 
from Catalina. If you have a data set and multiple reports connected to it, can you do this process for each or do we have to make repeat this process for each one? Yeah, so maybe I'll just keep sharing my screen. <laughs> um, what's really cool is that <coughs> on in the in the report, you will actually get. So I had a data set and a report all in one file, right? It still spits this out. So it will spit this out to a data set, a folder, and a report. If I had one data set, I might just have one data set here, and then I can have a bunch of different reports. There's actually a file in in report. If I go look at it, um, uh, I forget where it is. Metadata. I always forget. <laughs> I think it's this one, local settings, and it actually says which data set you're connected. I forget where it is. Um, yeah, path, I think this is it. And if, uh, there is a file, I can't remember if this is in my head, but it actually says, you know, this report is connected to this data set. And you can have multiple reports in this file. Um, and you can have multiple different data sets and different data reports all within um, the same repo. Uh, Will comments made while writing DAX with Power BI desktop yeah. be captured in Git? Yeah, so it, it copies the code pretty much verbatim. So everything you write is in this. So DAX and everything lives in the data set, and they have this model.bim file. And they are working on better ways of doing this, but this has all your, I can't even find it. This has all your DAX code. It'll have all the comments in your DAX code. Um, to this, it doesn't really matter. It's just whatever you put in DAX, it will add that in into this. So it will capture everything that you have in your data set. It'll be in here somewhere. <laughs> As I say, this works a lot better. This will work a lot better, hopefully, when they work on this file, because I, I can't tell you what changed when I look at two of these, right? Um, theoretically, it's not supported in preview. but And please don't do this, but you could. You could write a Power BI file now if you wanted, um, if you knew, <laughs> if you knew this code. Don't, <laughs> but you know, you could actually just edit this directly. Yeah, if I'm not wrong, there is another uh, another thing that uh, maybe we should mention about this scripting language in JSON files. This, this yeah. is, this, uh, if, if, if I'm not wrong, this is a tabular model scripting language, and there's a transition from scripting language to something new, which is called Tabular model definition yeah. language. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if you yeah. want to watch a recording about this, uh, you can check the link in the chat window. Yeah. So when I say Microsoft are working on this, Matthias, <laughs> he's, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. he's a great guy. Um, he doesn't work for Microsoft, but he, he actually he lives in London too. Um, he's basically come up with this new format. I mean, I think Microsoft will adopt it soon. So it makes it human readable and it's it's great. And he does loads on Git. So that's what it's, it's done. So yes, definitely go and have a look at that and see what's, it's available now, but not officially supported. So hopefully it'll be supported very soon. Exactly. The code is much cleaner in the yeah. Tinder. Much yeah, cleaner. this is, this is horrible. I can't see anything. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> I don't know what this means. Exactly. Alec, ah, like you can see uh, some DAX here, and this would be where your comments would be included as well. Exactly. Uh, please feel free to ask your questions. You can write it into chat window or just unmute yourself. Uh, from my side, uh, the thing is, those things are quite confusing for many of us, including me, and my core business is Power BI. <laughs> Even I struggle with <laughs> those features because there are too many features started at the same time. There are some mm -hmm. connections between them, but they are not very clear. Should I use deployment pipelines or Git or DevOps? But yeah. Also, there, there are also lots of external tools, not only Tableau Editor. editor uh, there are many, many tools which are very useful uh, in enterprise level development. But the thing is, the customers, most of the customers are sometimes reluctant to accept these external tools. This is another thing. Yeah, no, I, I very much agree. And I, my my take on it's always been, I'm not rushing off to do everything you get <laughs> <Exactly>. now. 
I think it's very good to start learning because um, some projects you might come in, they might do Git. Right? Git isn't, as I said earlier, in, the, in this isn't to do with Power BI. It's a process that's in software development. So mm-hmm. sometimes when you go into teams, they might be already using this. I mean, I think it's really important. And I think companies will start doing it more with Power BI. I think you've got a while, though, <laughs> before everyone starts doing it. So Exactly. That yeah. too. And it takes very learning off. And I think uh, m- many of my customers are describing Microsoft as the number one company in the world that confuses us a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, please don't be shy. Uh, they're almost time out. I think people are confused. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely but, go uh, to uh, also would like to learn uh, these features. It's quite confusing, and th- th- that was a very good summarization of everything. Steve, thanks a lot. We do have a hand up, so please feel free to come up me. If you only do Git in the the workspace, you don't necessarily need to have the test and pro pro workspaces as public workspaces, right? I don't know. Um, no, I guess not. Um, I don't know if there's licensing if you publish something to a fabric and copy. I don't think so. Deployment pipelines, you'll need them in premium, um, but you could use PPU for tests and stuff. So, yeah, there's probably some combinations. Um, again, fabric's new, all the good stuff new, so I'll have to think through and you'll probably have to test the licenses, but you're you're correct. And a lot of people do PPU, for example, for a test, because it's cheaper and only a few people ever use it. But yes. Yeah, I'm sure there's going to be a number of different ways we combine licensing on different workspaces. Yeah, exactly. Okay, last chance to ask questions. Okay, Stephen. I think we are done. The recording will be okay, available cool. in a week after the meetup. You will uh, you will be informed via the uh, Power BI Turkey user group meetup. It's a great pleasure to us again. Uh, that was very good summarization of everything. Uh, <laughs> I learned a lot. Thanks a lot. Yeah, definitely watch the video again. Go to that website I I sent as well because I I put a lot of these um, broken up. But yeah, we want to rewatch. So thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, really, really thanks for having me again. Thanks. Before we finish the meetup, uh, I strongly recommend you to check Steve's training content. Steve is one of the most complete developers I have ever met. You will like it. Check his site, thank you. please. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot. Have a thank good you. day.